My message in this lifetime really is, and this book I think really captures it, that it is possible to be here for all of this, and that you just have to be willing to take the steps necessary to come back down into your body, because you're coming back not only into your individual trauma, you're coming back into the collective and ancestral. Welcome to The Art of Humanity. I'm your host, Jessica Ann. This is my podcast, where you can listen for fresh perspectives with artists, leaders, authors, and your favorite entrepreneurs. You can explore creativity and consciousness, evolve your business with the art of humanity. Now, here's this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of The Art of Humanity. If you're listening in real time, I hope you're enjoying the holiday season and you're off to an amazing 2020. If you're listening in the distant or not so distant future, I hope you're enjoying whatever time of year that it is and that you're surrounded by people and community who love and appreciate you for you. The next decade is already knocking on our door. At the beginning of each year, I look back on the previous year to see what worked, what didn't, and what I can take from all of my experiences to make the most of the present. This process helps to hold me accountable so that I can more fully show up in my life and business. Chris Brogan introduced the concept of honing in on three words at the beginning of each year. These three words are in place of setting a New Year's resolution. You come up with three distinct and separate words that will guide your choices and actions for the coming year. I started this process back in 2011. Since then, it's allowed me to create with more intention and flow. The word for 2019 was joy and I usually write a post that prompts reflection and gratitude for everything I've accomplished. Not in a navel-gazing way, of course, but it really helps me to see the big picture on life. So look out for the post in the new year. It always takes me some time to fully decompress out of the previous year and ease into the new year. So if you're feeling the same and you're feeling all the pressure to be so productive when the clock strikes midnight, January 1st, as we all are, because it's society and that's what we do, just know that a few extra days or weeks or however much time you need is totally okay. As long as you're authentically connecting to your true inner world, it's totally okay. So let's talk about this word authenticity. You hear it all the time. And in today's interview, my guest wrote something about authenticity in his book, Spiritual Graffiti, and it really resonates with me. He wrote, authenticity is not just a word. It's not just a trendy concept. It's not just a way to sell a product. It's a heart core path. It's a perilous path. It's a way of being that is not influenced by political considerations, not concerned with how it will be judged, not soling itself out for the mighty dollar. An authentic being bows down before nothing untrue. She owns her truth no matter the consequences. She is inspired from the inside out. It's time to reclaim the word authentic before it becomes as disingenuous as the words enlightened and spiritual. It ain't authentic unless it's nakedly true. I love this man's words and how he pours his heart onto the pages of his many books, like the passage I just read. My guest today is one of my most popular guests from season one, and I wanted to bring him back because he has a new book out, which I absolutely love. And by love... I have to say, it was one of the hardest books that I read this year because of the truth and wisdom that emanates through the fabric of every achingly brutal scenario and thought of the main character. Jeff's most recent book is called Grounded Spirituality, and it hits really close to home for me and many in the spiritual communities. After a two-year stint in Los Angeles that had me rethinking everything about my practice, I reread his book a few times and... It's a needed message crafted in a way that it's acceptable, but also highly critical of the many spiritual teachers out there who may inform some of us to spiritually bypass. Or perhaps it enables the reader to polish their own mirror, which it did for me as well. I've decided to include it in my best books of 2019, and you'll see why once we dig into this conversation. Born in Toronto, Canada, Jeff Brown did all the things he was supposed to do to become successful in the eyes of the world. He was on the Dean's Honor List as an undergraduate. He won the Law and Medicine Prize in law school. He apprenticed with the top criminal lawyer, Eddie Greenspan. It had been Brown's lifelong dream to practice criminal law and search for the truth in the courtroom. But then, on the verge of opening a law practice, 
He heard a little voice inside him telling him to stop, just stop. With great difficulty, he honored this voice and began a heartfelt quest for the truth that lived within him. Although he didn't realize it at the time, Brown was actually questing for his innate image, the essential being that he came into this lifetime to embody. He was searching for his authentic face. As part of his journey, Brown surrendered to his confusion and explored many possible paths. He studied bioenergetics and did session work with co-founder Alexander Lowen. He practiced as a body-centered psychotherapist. He completed an MA in psychology at Saybrook Graduate School in San Francisco and co-founded the Open Heart Gang, a benevolent gang with a heartfelt intention. He started his own business and became a successful entrepreneur. The most important thing Jeff did, however, was the inner work. By going inside and connecting his spirituality with his emotional life, he learned essential lessons. By learning to surrender to the school of heart knocks, the school of life, he found his authentic face and embraced the call to write soul shaping. Although he resisted it at first, he soon realized that honoring the call was his best defense against sleeplessness. If he wrote, he slept. If he didn't, he lay awake all night. This is the nature of a calling. If you like this podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and my personal preference, Overcast. Wherever you listen to your pods, find the art of humanity and give the show five stars. Reviews are easy and they take about five seconds, and I really appreciate it. Next week, I plan to share some great news for anyone interested in podcasting. I'm launching a course that will not only help you launch, but it'll get your new podcast launched right with monetization in mind. Many cool projects coming up in 2020, including my new book. It's going to be an awesome year. To learn more, follow me on socials at Being is Human, and you can visit my website, artofhumanity.io, as well as jessicaannmedia.com. Sending you infinite gratitude for being here with me today and wishing you all of the joy and blessings into 2020. Now let's get to today's interview. Welcome to the Art of Humanity, where we explore creativity and consciousness to allow you and your business to evolve. Today, I'm so excited to have with me as a second time guest, Jeff Brown. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me on the Art of Humanity. It's good to be with you, Jess. Jeff, I'm not joking when I say that your work has changed my life. I stumbled upon your book, An Uncommon Bond, back in 2015, and for those who don't know this book, it's an unforgettable higher consciousness love story that takes the reader through a broad range of ecstatic and painful experiences as the couple struggles to find their way through complicated emotional terrain. I'm getting choked up just reading that sentence. (laughs) It has been one moment after another of questioning and surrendering to my path, and it originally came to me as a download and a strong voice. And, you know, reading your words have inspired me to make the decision to go deeper into the inner work. This prompted me to make many decisions throughout the course of the past four years. I've examined my childhood trauma. You know, I've left relationships. I've also investigated why it's a problem that I always want to meditate, something that you refer to in your book as spiritual bypassing, which we'll get into in a little bit. Jeff, your most recent book, Grounded Spirituality, really struck a chord with me, and I wrote about it on my Instagram, and I'll share my thoughts here. Jeff's words pulsate off the page, mirroring my spiritual journey in many ways. The depth of my being has veered through the spiritual variety pack, from broken to disassociative to quote-unquote enlightened. These experiences have all shaped me. I've only just begun this book. This was back in April when I first read it. (laughs) But tears are streaming down my face and my heart is howling like it's finally heard. Yes, a book can put us in our heads, but it can also pave the path for healing our hearts. Whatever happens to your heart or mind when you read, this book plants the seed of grounded possibility for humankind. If you're on the spiritual path, and especially if the teachings of Toll don't resonate with you, pick up this book. It has a forward with one of my other favorite authors, Andrew Harvey. Bravo, Jeff. Grateful for you, your words, and your devotion to truth. So, Jeff, the most important thing that you did was the inner work, which you truly, truly embody in your writing. And the stories in your books allow your readers to drop in and really feel safe so that we can let go of any defenses that we might have and melt into our existence beyond these layers. And they go deep. (laughs) By having these experiences, the collective 
you know, the listeners, the readers of your book can really experience this now that feels more authentic and true, minus wearing any mask. And people are breaking down these days because they can't carry the weight of the falsity any longer. As you describe in your book with one of the main characters, Michael, you know, he goes through extremely intense experience going through the various layers of his spirituality. So I'm curious, is the inner work the most important work we can do today? And how can listeners who may have similar experiences as Michael and as I have get clarity in a world that masquerades itself as something else and wearing lots of masks? I mean, I think that the deeper somatic emotional work is fundamental to real transformation, you know, to sustainable, not just to sort of having glimpses of possibility or peak experiencers or something. They all serve a purpose. But if we don't land all of that within ourselves in the form of an inclusive or integrated consciousness, then we just end up bifurcated and split off from various aspects of ourselves. And so I think that the real work now and the real work has always been if you're seeking something that approximates wholeness uh, within the self, is to go inside of the traumatized body temple, you know, all those chambers of feeling, many of which that have been over-contained and constricted and restrained and repressed, and, you know, do your best to excavate the material that wants to come to the surface and create space to move the material through to whatever transformation lives at the end of it. I mean, I think that we're at a strange and interesting time. You know, when I first wrote Soul Shaping, I wasn't really very conscious of this thing called climate change, you know. So doing that deeper work internally seemed like the most important thing I could do. And now it feels to me like as much as I think it's important and essential work, we also have to do work in the outer world even if we're not quite there yet in the inner world, in order to make sure that we protect and preserve our species. You know, so for me, like the psychotherapeutic work is spirituality. For me, repressed emotions are unactualized spiritual lessons. I make no distinction between emotional maturation and spiritual maturation. And I think that we have to become more whole, in other words, not split between the psyche and the spirit, not split between selfhood, localized selfhood, and this thing that patriarchal spiritualists call, you know, the absolute self, which I don't even believe exists. Well, let me just say we have to bring what is the absolute self. I mean, I think it's just another symbol of dissociation in the patriarchal spiritual movement, notions of higher than, notions of absolute self, disconnecting from the ego, bashing, dissolving the ego, which is ridiculous. I couldn't have this conversation with you without a healthy ego calling my emotions an illusion, pulling myself up and away from the world in order to find this thing that's supposed to be an enlightened consciousness. But yet when I come back into the world and have to integrate, I'm completely lost, confused, and triggered because in fact nothing in the deep within has actually changed. And so for me, the important thing now is for us to do the deeper emotional work to get real so we can get here together and stop dissociating from here so that we can actually take action to preserve, protect the species and the planet. So now we don't have any time anymore to keep everything separate in separate distinct parts. Some things masked, some things exposed, some things something called heightened, some things called something else. We have to do the work now to become more enrealed. And that's why I wrote this book, you know, to invite people and to permission people who feel they need that permission to move in the direction of clearing all of this debris that we hold so we can become more intact and more integral. And in that state, we're more likely to see what's going on in the world around us and to take action than if we're in a dissociated state where we think we're higher than the human experience. And meanwhile, the forests are burning and none of us are noticing because we've convinced ourselves that that's just a story that doesn't have any reality to it. Right there. That's such a great example of ways in which we bypass and say that, quote unquote, nothing is real. Yeah, sure, sure. It's all unreal until mm -hmm. it kills you. I mean, you know, that's why these, you know, I don't, I, I understand the value of Ta Tole's work or Adyashanti's work, you know, that for me, these are first stages of awakening teachers. And they're inviting us to pull up and out and away from and to witness our patterns and to realize there is other frameworks of perception. That's valuable. I mean, that was, the I think, the first step that I took in my journey was to 
go through various experiences that would allow me to understand that the way that I was interfacing with reality was only one way. And I think it's a necessary step like in our growth, in our evolution. I feel like if we can't get our nervous system to a place that's calm and centered for at least a little bit in our lives, <laughs> then we can't really grow eventually, you know, and then we can integrate it eventually. But I feel like spiritual bypassing is a necessary part of the process. I mean, it's an interesting question, Jess. I mean, of course, we need a more expansive lens. We need to get some rest from this perpetual hammering, what people call the monkey mind, what I would call the monkey heart. But let's leave that off to the side for the moment. And to nestle into a different, what might be experienced as a more unified field of consciousness. And that's fine. But then what? So now we have a more expansive perspective. Now we understand that we're not just that, but that we're also all that too. And now what do we do with that? We now have to come back down into the human body, into the human story, into the tissues, into the cells, into the trauma chambers, into all of it, and find a way to integrate this, what somebody might call transcendent perspective. I don't quite like really like that word anymore, but using it just for the moment with this more imminent or localized perspective so that we become the weave of all that is. The problem is, because so many people fled to this thing called transcendence with the intention of bypassing or getting away from the pain that they have to deal with in this human experience, many of them never want to come back down. It's too painful and difficult to kind of reconnect with the unresolved emotional body. They felt so much relief getting away from it And then they end up living their lives bifurcating. You know, suicide rates are very high. I mean, during Trump time, I think that's been proven to be true. But I think in particular, suicide rates are also high with the New Cage movement. And I think probably if anyone did a study, they would find they're very high right now because these self-avoidant techniques, self-avoidance masquerading as enlightenment, is actually killing people because they fire their therapist. They disconnect from the belief that their story has any truth or value. All of it is unreal. And then they're left just floating away from this world at a time when it is really impossible to float away from anything because the material is in the ethos and is everywhere, you know? So grounded spirituality is just about coming back home and trying to bridge back to here. And when I would just kind of had a bypassing intention, my experience of this thing we could call the unified consciousness field was very, very different from my experience of that field when it came up and through a depthful experience of my own body. The latter felt sustainable, for sure, more sustainable, but it was actually qualitatively different. It was like I was seeing it through a greater number of eyes when it was coming from my more integrated self than what I was seeing through that disconnected state. It's really tricky. So sure, it's true you need to have an experience of that thing, but if you're doing it solely with the intention of running away from yourself, I'm not sure you're having much of a unified experience because it's like the non-dualists, all these pseudo-non-dualists who call themselves you know, unity consciousness people, and they've bifurcated and split off from the body, the feelings, the self, the ego, everything human. In other words, everything uncomfortable in the quest for something unified. It doesn't even make sense. How do you access a true unified field if you're not deeply in your body? Totally. And it's really tricky when you're towing these lines because as some of us do who are seekers, you know, you enter these quote unquote transcendent states, for lack of a better word, you know, the enlightened state of existence where you are not you. It's this unity consciousness. And it's nice to want to stay there. You know, I'm not denying that it is like numbing out. There's what is better? Is it meditating or is it drinking? You know, you think meditating is better than drinking. Many people believe that. But at the same time, it can be dangerous. It can be really dangerous. Yeah, it depends on your intention. Yeah. Sure. It depends why you're doing it and how you do it and for how long you do it. And all. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, an addiction is an addiction is an addiction. And, you know, whether it's served you for a period of time to allow you to survive impossible circumstances, it's fine. But I personally don't want to spend my entire life in an addicted state. I'd like, I mean, my work in this lifetime is to try to find a way to become more integrated. It's very clear to me. Every time I try to bifurcate for too long or bypass too deeply, I just trip over myself. It, gets, it just doesn't work for me. And I get that it works for some people, and it's fine. But my message in this lifetime really is, and this book I think really captures it, that it is possible to be here for all of this. And you just have to be willing to take the steps necessary 
to come back down into your body because you're coming back not only into your individual trauma, you're coming back into the collective and ancestral trauma that you're carrying and then do the work and work the weave so that you become more deeply present for all of this, this thing called unity and this thing called the localized self. That is the experience of Jeff Brown in my case. Yeah. And the example that you shared, you know, before when you're telling listeners, you know, that people are committing suicide at really high rates and firing their therapists, it's because our nervous systems aren't recalibrated to handle a lot of life, I think, on this planet, whether it's through meditation or too much yoga or just focusing on all the quote unquote happiness in the world and joy without actually feeling it. Like mostly it comes down to just being in your mind and not actually genuinely feeling it in your body. And there's a total difference in me. I know when I feel integrated, I genuinely feel the emotions running through every cell of my being. And a part of me thought that I was, and I'm still a little bit confused, to be honest, after reading your book. And (laughs) I'm not sure if I was spiritually bypassing. I moved to LA about three years ago, and then I moved to San Francisco six months ago, and I can test myself a little clearly, more clearly than I could while now that I'm in a new city, reflecting back at my time in LA. And, you know, I in LA, I really was like way off in the ether, you know, and I feel like I wasn't grounded that much. So then I moved to Sausalito and I ended up being in the muck of humanity. And I was like, this is what I need. I need to be grounded. And now that I'm grounded, quote unquote, I feel like I am like re-traumatizing myself unnecessarily by being in environments that aren't supportive and that aren't creative and where I can't thrive. So what's the difference between being in an environment where you can thrive versus putting yourself in an environment where you are re-traumatizing yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I like the term selective attachment, you know, so at various stages on your journey, depending on what you need, I mean, Sometimes there were times when I needed to go into really hardcore, harsh environments to wake me down or to help me to understand more of the human experience as part of my writing, part of my work to bring some kind of a message to the world. So it depends where you're at. But for me right now to go into those environments, it wouldn't be particularly uncomfortable like it was at various times because I think I'm a bit sturdier now than I was. But I wouldn't do it because it doesn't serve me. I would choose to not selectively attach to those environments, just like I choose not to selectively attach to particular individuals that don't serve my, no, I don't use the term my highest good, but more my truest good. So I think it really depends. You know, I mean, this is where this spiritual messaging and sort of psychotherapeutic wisdom haven't really found the way that they come together. So for me, the, it's very simple. It's like, sometimes you need to go back. Sometimes is a great word, right? Because it allows us to not make definitive statements that certainly don't apply to everybody. Sometimes it's good. I'm a really extreme person. So sometimes it's. (laughs) Yeah. So great. It's well, this is balancing. This is grounded spirituality. So sometimes it serves us to be in situations, relationships, or environments that can trigger us or make us feel kind of re-traumatized, possibly because we need that to be reminded of what we're holding and we're working it out therapeutically. I mean, I don't think you should just keep doing that, but sometimes we need those experiences. And sometimes the last thing you need, because of where you're at, you're at a very sensitive, subtle place in your own transformation. You know, I went through that when I put away my edginess, my resilient aspect, my harshness, and tried to explore a more surrendered, receptive way of being. During those stages, I stayed away from airports, uh, intensely uncomfortable environments, really edgy, unintegrated feeling people kinds of things that I could withstand a little bit better now because I'm at a different stage of my own process. How many years did you avoid airports? Was it months? I think the time, I shouldn't say avoid, I should say it was a very uncomfortable experience. And I, I think in the first draft of Soul Shipping, I had a whole part about airports that we never ended up using. But I remember like I'd go to Harbin Hot Springs for two weeks in California, get endless massage, endless watsu, peel away layers, cry, rage. And I wrote about some of that in Grounded Spirituality and an Uncommon Bond and Soul Shaping. And I think I even described the experience in Soul Shaping of then going after that to San Francisco Airport, which is actually a pretty gentle airport compared to many, and just finding it overwhelmingly harsh and uncomfortable. I was softening in a way that was incongruent with the survivalist edge of the culture. That was how I was exploring the deepening, more authentic aspects of the self, not the adapted self, but the authentic self. And 
So going back into the harshness of the world at that time was incredibly uncomfortable because I was swinging in the other direction. Now I feel like I'm kind of holding both okay. So I don't like those environments, but I don't feel as though they're pulling me away from my sacred purpose or my true self any longer. Now this is 20 years later. Right. So that's an answer to your question. I love it. Okay. So going back to the San Francisco airport, which coincidentally, I had a quote unquote transcendent experience there not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And airports, just like you, they used to be a really ungrounded place for me. And I flew into San Francisco airport. I think this is in February of this past year. The very beginning of this year, I was having a lot of these quote unquote, like enlightening experiences. And I keep putting it in quotes because enlightenment isn't the end all be all of humanity. So, Well, it's not, it, it may be, we, the problem is we don't even know what the right. word means, but continue. Okay. So yeah. in the San Francisco airport, I was floating. I mean, I was experiencing true joy and bliss just like flowing through my body. Like I was crying. I was so happy. And I could feel it in every cell of my being. And every one I looked at was just like radiating this pure, just joy and bliss and ecstasy. And it was just almost like overwhelming sense of love. And it was unity consciousness, I guess. And I couldn't stop crying. And I was in public. And I normally would only have these experiences when I'm by myself, you know, after meditation or yoga. But here I am in the middle of a crowded airport having this completely transcendent experience so what do you say to that when you can have these transcendent experiences while in the muck of humanity? So the problem is we'd have to spend days defining the word transcendent. So what I heard you say, and I may have heard mm -hmm. you wrong, was that you entered into a state where you felt in your body, you said, in your cells. So you weren't floating above yourself. You were within yourself. You were connecting to a really beautifully loving experience of self and other in that moment that brought tears to your eyes, pretty much. Is that pretty much it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you narrowed it down pretty simply, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. yeah, so yes, yeah. Well, not to trivialize the veracity of your experience, but only to say that the way I would distinguish between that being ungrounded experience of something called transcendence or a grounded and more integrated experience of something called transcendence is if you, or if it was me, if I was in that airport looking at all those people, and I've had many experiences like what you described, where I felt so filled with love and saw so much of the golden light of humanity in other. If when I'm looking at those people, all I see and believe is true is the golden light, then I'm having a bypass experience. If I'm looking at those people, seeing all the beautiful golden light within them, the great potential that lives within them, their intrinsic magnificence, and at the same time, at that moment, also able to see the neurotic material, the fact that they're holding all kinds of unresolved stuff, that they're trapped in all kinds of fucked up conditioning and patterns, then to me, that's a grounded transcendent experience and a grounded spiritual experience. So which one did you have? Ooh, I got full body chills because it was the latter. It was yeah, the so latter. you're seeing all of what it is. You're seeing all the beautiful possibilities. Your heart is opening to humanity. You're bridging to humanity in this wonderful way, in this public place. You're also aware that they're not feeling that. They may be agitated, worried, concerned, all kinds of a million things, zillion things are happening. And so, I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, I don't think walking around always feeling cynical and negative and not loving towards humanity is a more evolved state than feeling beautifully loving towards humanity. I think that's wonderful. It doesn't feel transcendent in the sense that it's, I mean, it may be transcending our localized usual experience, but it sounds like an integrated experience. You're in your humanity and you're loving humanity, and it's allowing you to see that we are all connected and that we're not only this localized worry mind or whatever language the patriarchal spiritualists use for it. It's all there for you. The whole mishpucha, as we say in Jewish. Great. <laughs> The mishpukka, I love it. I love what you're saying. And then there's like the ego part of me that's like, yes, I'm a grounded spiritual person. And then it's like, then your ego comes into the play. And I kind of always tend to hear your voice in my mind whenever I'm now experiencing these states because I'm always trying to like make sure one foot is firmly planted on the ground of earth. It'll serve you and it'll serve us. Yeah. And then you can ask yourself what ego you're talking about. I mean, this dissolution of the ego thing as being seen as the highest state is preposterous. That's a mental illness, that teaching. That's the teaching of trauma survivors who don't realize that they are trauma survivors and actually believe they found the better and superior way and that you have to dissolve these aspects of the self in order to truly become a highly spiritually evolved being. And 
Of course, that's inherently preposterous. It's a big time cop out. And what you want to do is develop a healthy, intact, solid ego, a solid sense of the sacred human self and understand there is this thing called the unhealthy or narcissistic ego, however you language it. For me, it's about finding the balance between understanding where the oceans of essence, let's say, meet the individual droplet of meaning. If you swing too far towards just the ocean, you're now bypassing reality and you're pulling up and out of the self. If you're so lost in the individual droplet of meaning, you don't see any bigger, vaster picture, then you're now almost so grounded as to be buried and self-absorbed in a way that's not actually serving you. For me, the work is and has always been. And sometimes you need to go more in one direction to develop that wing and then come back in the other direction. I call it Western consciousness, right? The quest for essence and unity consciousness fundamental to some Eastern spiritualities and the quest for a healthy rooted self-concept fundamental to good Western psychology. So finding the balance between those two, where you're holding an awareness of all of those things. And Andrew Harvey wrote about it and talked about that alchemy in the forward and grounded spirituality. I thought he did that very eloquently. To me, that's the work. And the healthy ego is the thing that straddles and holds both of those two awarenesses at the same time. Yeah, the healthy ego straddles. That's good. I like that visual. Straddling. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I think I won't yeah. say any more about that. <laughs> I have a pretty visual, imaginative mind. But it's interesting because the ones who call themselves enlightened usually have the most work to do as you tend to call out a lot of these spiritual quote unquote gurus out there, aka bullshit artists, because they're kind of rising above the muck of humanity is saying that they're better than everyone else. So you look at their personal lives. Yeah. Listen, anyone who tells you they're enlightened, stop, absolute state is yeah. unwell. All you need to know is the moment you hear it, this is an unwell person. But I'm not saying that without compassion or sympathy. I don't like when it's used by people who call themselves teachers and they get Godjectified and do tremendous amounts of damage and exploit hordes and hordes of people. I hate that, you know? But I understand where it's coming from, and I understand that it's coming from unresolved trauma, and it's coming from a desperate need to be seen or characterized in a particular light. Because if we enable them in that belief that they're enlightened, they can continue to avoid their stuff. And so talk about awakening, but not awakened. I'm there for that conversation. But tell me that you're awakened, and that's the end of the story. Well, then that just tells me that you haven't even really even begun the journey. So there are so many of these spiritual coaches and mentors out there. How can we honor this work that we do by bringing awareness to these topics while not questioning you know, ourselves? You know, How can we be seen as like you consider yourself a writer, I guess. You don't consider yourself a spiritual person, but you're doing the work of like, I feel like we are all doing the work of God. You know, We are here. We are grounded. The ones who are real and here and grounded. How can we really honor our calling and not question ourselves? Well, I think that self-questioning, you know, I'm just doing a course called Writing Your Way Home on, on Soul Shaping Institute that I do a few times a year. And, and so much of the work of the course is, it isn't really about writing in some ways. It's really about just activating the belief within the student that they have a right to write, right? That they have a right to express themselves, that they are worthy of the voice that's rising from within them. And we've been ashamed and shunned collective from the very beginning, taught that we were sinners, born sinners. I mean, if there's a God, Certainly, that God did not go to all this trouble to bring us into existence just so we would walk around feeling horribly about ourselves, uh, riddled with self-hatred, and incapable of manifesting our magnificence, all these great gifts and offerings and abilities and that live so deeply within us because we're just thinking we're not worth anything. I mean, the most important work we can do. You know, I went through this experience years ago when I was writing Soul Shaping. And I had a family member who was in a lot of difficulty again, and my pattern was to sort of put away my own focus in order to help them. But this felt like kind of a crucial time because my writing voice was coming alive, and, and yet I was still attached to that pattern. So I spoke with a spiritual teacher that some listeners may know named Ram Das, who wrote Be oh, Here Now. I, I knew Ram never Das. Never heard of him. <laughs> Just a little Ram Das. No big deal. I know, no. Well, yeah, but I'm not name dropping. There's a reason I'm telling yeah. you this, but some people don't actually haven't heard of him. I'll put a link to his stuff in the show notes. Yeah, sure. And because I met him when we did Carmageddon and we had subsequent uh, conversations and dialogue. So I called him and, you know, I said, so I want to do this. This is my pattern, you know, and he was very clear to with me. He said, I'm paraphrasing. He said, the most that you can do for all of us is to become all that you're meant to become. It seems almost like common sense to me now. But at the time, I was straddling, again, the line between falling back into a pattern that would pull me away from my sacred purpose, individual sacred purpose, 
to go and help somebody. And rather than bringing a voice to the world, that's helped a fair number of people now. And I understand exactly now what he was talking about. The problem is that because we were taught, many of us in condition to believe, that we can't be all that, that we can't call ourselves magnificent. We used to, even as kids, before hearing the bashing of the ego, the ego was bashed culturally in Western culture. Don't be egotistical. If you said, I'm great at something, that was called egotistical. So we get it from both sides, actually, right? The ungrounded Eastern spirituality and the self-bashing Western consciousness. And our work, really, and we better hurry up and get on with it, is to realize how extraordinary and magnificent we are without thinking that we're all that, rather than leading in the other direction and then allowing ourselves only a few moments where we can acknowledge something of value about ourselves. And the most of the time we get rewarded for this thing called being humble which often means self-hating, actually, in many cases. So the work is to be able to reach a stage where you believe in your voice enough and you can push through until it gets more solid and seamless inside of you to the place where you bring your voice, your message, your offering to the world. Every single individual that I have ever encountered, no matter what state or form they are in, carries an extraordinary and truly magnificent sacred purpose, broadly defined, includes all kinds of lessons, callings, offerings that they are here to embody and to bring into a manifestation and into the world. And most of us are walking around just thinking that we're not worth anything, really. And all of this greatness just gets lost. And it's just one of the most tragic things. Yeah. Pima Shodran once said, nothing ever goes away until it teaches us what you need to know. It's one of those spiritual aphorisms I've heard often. Yeah, I mean, or it kills you, you know, or it kills you, right? I mean, so let's, there's the grounded part. Like, sure, isn't that wonderful? We don't get a thousand years in a lifetime to keep walking down the same dumb road. We, at some point, you have to realize that, sure, maybe you need to walk down it a certain number of times before you are ready to face the material that you're holding. But you don't want to do it for 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years because you don't have that many years. So at some point, we have to take this thing seriously enough to stop delaying the process of reclaiming, integrating, transforming, and healing the self itself. Totally. And you go deeper into this in your book, particularly around sacred purpose. And the main character in the book, Michael, talks about divine purpose, which implies that our purpose is emanating from something outside of the self, almost as though we are being used as some kind of divinely channeled instrument. Whereas you use the word sacred because it doesn't immediately imply that our reasons for being originate outside of ourselves. Sacred purpose, I'm reading from page 267 in your book, sacred purpose empowers the self and acknowledges its sacrosanct and intrinsically purposeful nature. Let's begin here within our own flesh and bones before considering our interface with the divine. Wow. And that's not to say there isn't an interface with the divine. It's to say that if we keep, again, focusing on the divine as being the source of everything, it often gets used as a way that desacralizes or diminishes the profound and godly nature of humanhood, right? So I'm not suggesting that if you work through all of what you're holding that's blocking access to all that you can be, and if you then actualize all that you can be, that you will not then feel connected to the divine. You may feel more brilliantly and transparently and solidly connected to the divine. But if we keep focusing on great achievements as being out of this world, we keep sending the message that it didn't come from the self, it came from something outside of the self. And that's the same bashing routine we've been hearing, certainly in patriarchal spirituality, but throughout Western consciousness in so many ways, and Eastern consciousness, that is the desacralizing of the self. We're so afraid of the empowered self, and we can see from a financial perspective how marketing constructs, unconscionable marketing constructs, unconscionable political constructs, benefit immeasurably from us being uncentered and self-hating, because if you're centered and if you know who you are and why you're here, you don't need to keep buying a bunch of stupid things, and you can make centered and solid and clarified decisions. So unfortunately, there are a lot of structures in place that have a lot invested in keeping us uh, quite a bit smaller than, in fact, we really are. So when I started to talk about sacred purpose, everyone was saying divine purpose. And this was the shift point within me that was happening around my own grounding process. I looked around, I didn't see it used, and I started to use it with my coursework because it doesn't diminish or deny the possibility of divinity. It's just, it doesn't immediately tell you that your purpose exists as something outside of this extraordinary selfhood. 
it starts right in the heart of the selfhood. Totally. And one of the best things that we can do as humans is somatic therapy. And you mentioned this in your book and you mentioned this in some of your work. Thankfully, I'm working with an amazing somatic therapist right now addressing the trauma and melting the armor. And it just feels so good. Like it hurts. It's so fucking painful to be witnessed in your pain. But it is one of the most terrifyingly beautiful things we can do to get grounded. Because every week when I show up, it's just melting the away of the falsehoods. And I don't know necessarily what this does for the quote unquote materialism or the capitalism. It does nothing for the good of like that old paradigm that we worked in, but it feels like we're emerging into this new type of humanity where we're dissolving all of the fabrications and we're just showing up real and raw as fuck and just being human with all of our emotions and all of our pain. And is there anything else that you'd recommend? Because thanks to you, you know, I found a good somatic therapist and I know that there are a lot of people out there who are healing and need, you know, a lot of recalibration of their nervous systems in order to deal with the world today. Are there any other tools that you recommend? Yeah. I mean, holotropic breathwork, I consider to be a somatic psychotherapy if it's used with that intention. Somatic experiencing, Peter Levine's work, is doing a tremendous amount of good in the world. Bioenergetics, Alexander Lowen's originating work with John Paracos is like the foundational work of all of it, is utterly brilliant. Core energetics as well. I mean, you know, all depends on finding the right practitioner. The fact that it's that therapy doesn't, or this therapy doesn't necessarily mean everything. You know, and I think that creating what I called in soul shaping solitude, creating space and time to interface with the soul self, to find the soul self, the needle in the haystack of your consciousness in this overwhelming Trumpian world that we're in, where it's so very difficult to feel our center and find the soul, the voice of the soul, and feel so painful to drop down into the body because of where the ethos is. Now is the time when we must, we insist on turning off the devices and going out into nature and reconnecting with our center or connecting with our center for the first time. And that was helpful. Selective attachment is a very good practice. Be careful where you go and who you encounter, depending on where you're at on the journey. Healthy boundaries are always good for this process, wherever you're at in everything, just because people often call themselves empaths when they have terrible boundaries. And I would encourage people to look more closely at that question because it's another bypassing technique. It's a way of not acknowledging that you have shitty boundaries. And because it is possible to be able to feel other people's experience, but still have very clearly demarcated boundaries around you and where you end and they begin. And so that you're not getting caught in codependent fusions all the time because you can feel their experience and lose your center. It's important to have and develop solid, strong, asserted, healthy boundaries to know where you end and the other begins and to know how to maneuver on your path. As my voice has gone out there, it's so largely out there, but I have a very different life experience than I did five years ago, for example. And people come often with all kinds of ideas and opportunities. And I've had to develop even more assertive boundaries than ever before in order to deal with all those opportunities because so many of them are misleading and self-serving and are not what they're presented to be. So boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. I love that quote of yours, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. So that's really important. And I think, you know, you mentioned the solitude and I think focusing on your internal growth versus the external appearances, I think goes really far on the journey that we're having today. I think the more that you focus on the external and how you come across, I think the easier it is to get led down the wrong path. The skill that we learn as we grow and we go along, you know? I mean, I think that there is, people talk about the great shift, and I don't buy any of that stuff. I mean, I spent enough time with humanity to know how many hundreds and thousands of years it's going to take for us to reach the stage where we really are embodying and actualizing all that we're meant to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just interviewed, well, I think he's going to be coming after you, a guest called Jim Rutt, where there's this concept in academia. So it's interesting to hear your perspective on this. It is going to take a while, you're thinking? (laughs) It's going to take a long, long time. I mean, we're crossing a bridge from a survivalist construct. Survivalism is a way of being, as a defining principle, as the way our whole society has been organized, to something I might call authenticity as a way of being. So under survivalist structure, you define who you are by what puts food on the table, and everything about you gets organized around that. In an authentic structure, you organize your world based on who you really are and why you're really here and what you're here to bring. And every single element of our society, for the most part, is going to have to change in order to be able to become congruent with that shift in our consciousness. We're at the very beginning of that. That's why a lot of people start doing deepening work and then they can't do their other job, but there's no other job to do because they need to survive economically. And the thing that they're becoming is not yet 
economic construct within society that can be gratifying and meet their economic needs. So we are the beginning. We are the pioneers. We are the first ones crossing the bridge, at least as a collective group, from a survivalist structure to an authentic structure. So that's why you see they swing to Barack, so we move towards a more progressive authentic structure. Then they swing back to the old crazy dinosaur, Trump, because he represents the most nasty, unconscionable elements of a survivalist structure. He's just a survivalist. There's nothing else to the man. He didn't develop anything else about himself. No other pathways have been traversed or developed. And, and that's what you're seeing now. And as the progressive authentic consciousness goes farther across the bridge, the conservative or regressive or survivalist consciousness that we stand on the shoulders of, let's never forget, gets more and more ornery and angry because it knows that it cannot meet us there and that there are fewer of them and now there's more of us. So every single element of society has to evolve, or most elements of society have to evolve, to reflect this movement towards a more authentic, progressive, inclusive consciousness. So this is the, why you see this extremely confusing tension for people, not only outside of themselves, but within themselves, because they were conditioned in a survivalist way of being, like Trump was, and yet they're moving developmentally in the direction of a more authentic, inclusive, holistic embodied, not just survivalist consciousness. We stand on the shoulders of survivalism. We must never forget that. But we're moving in another direction now. And that's why the battle is becoming so nasty, because the survivalist consciousness knows that it's doomed, and it doesn't have the willingness or the skill set. There's too much trauma in the survivalist structure. The hearts are too closed to move in the direction of what the rest of us are talking about. And it is only going to get nastier, nastier, this battle. And the only way you win as democracy is you have more of us and less of them. And that really is the truth of it, because that really firmly grips survivalist consciousness, in many cases, is absolutely immovable. The heart is much too closed. You can't explain to somebody what we're talking about in these kinds of podcasts. They have to have an experience of it. And if their heart is completely armored in a survivalist structure, they can't have an experience of it. So they will never experientially understand what you're talking about, and you will only ever be seen as a threat to their survivalist way of being. Wow. Yeah, it's like we're speaking a different language. <laughs> well, you are. You're speaking, one's trying to speak from a more progressive heart-centered place, and the others are just survivalists. So anybody who's not speaking survivalism is perceived to be a threat to their village. It's very simple. And that's what you're seeing in America. And that's so frustrating about it, but it's also what's liberating about it if you understand what's really happening. So we just have to keep moving towards a more authentic, inclusive consciousness. And that's how you win the democratic vote. And that's how that other consciousness fades out. Climate change is the one thing that worries me because climate change puts many of us, even those moving towards a more progressive, authentic consciousness, back into a survivalist state. And that worries me more than anything because we haven't gone far enough across the bridge yet to solidify this new way of being, concern is that the old way of being takes root for all of us. So, you know, you bring up an interesting topic with politics. And I know in a lot of the new age, and you call it new cage spiritual movements, that a lot of people want to transcend beyond politics identity. And what do you say to that? Is that called being <laughs> grounded? It's a bypass. Yeah. Oh, it, no, it's just a bypass. I mean, it's all, but yeah, they're all just bypass. I mean, it's like often I write posts, you know, I've written posts against Trump. I've written very favorably about Justin and Sophie Trudeau. And people will often say, I'm leaving your page. Why are you mixing politics with spirituality? Well, if you read my work, you understand that I don't distinguish spirituality mm, from any yeah. other part of the human experience. I don't even know what they're talking about. What they're talking about when they say that is, we want our spirituality to be the thing that allows us to get away from the discomforts of the human experience. And I'm saying, I want to invite you towards a spirituality that embraces every aspect of the human experience. If you just want to go float away, there's all kinds of float away teachers there, but they shouldn't be on my wall because that's not the message that I'm bringing for at least the last five or six years. You know? Totally. I think where your work hits home the most, and it really resonates because some people may hear your voice and read your work and make a choice. You have to make a choice to want to go deeper and examine that darker part of yourself that wants to continue bypassing. But this is the joke, Jess. The people who are resisting this more grounded framework of perception that think they have transcended it, they are actually survivalists. They are actually right standing right beside Donald Trump. They are in the exact same resistance to acknowledging, healing, and embodying their trauma. It's the same thing. They're just avoiding reality. He's avoiding reality with unconscionable capitalism. They're avoiding reality with sort of strangely pseudo-transcendent unity consciousness spiritual practices. It's the same thing. I don't make a distinction between Trump and the teachings of Tolle, for example, in Power of Now. 
to me, it was dissociative. I just felt that those teachings were dissociative. That was my personal view. I find Trump completely dissociative. I find all of these kinds of teaching that lead us away from the wholeness of our being, where we're witnessing our pain body, but not fully embodying it and doing the deeper work. From my personal view, all of that stuff is the same thing as the regressive consciousness in the American right. It's all the same thing, because all of these people, on one level or another, are avoiding the wholeness of their humanity. Wow. So if there is a mass movement towards a more inclusive consciousness or what you call a grounded spirituality, yeah. where do you see that leading us as a human race? Well, it's the only thing that can lead us away from the destruction of the species, and the destruction of the planet. I mean, if we keep dissociating, if we keep floating above, if we keep splitting off from, if we keep pondering our own navel in some meditative gaze state, we are not going, you know, there's a, what's that movie with John Cusack? It's like 2012 or whatever it was, right? When the end of the world movie. And the, the poster image for it is so perfect. You see all these kind of monks at the top of the mountain meditating or something. At least that's my memory of it. And then you hear the big waves coming. Yeah. So they're in this state because they've spent so much time like yogic flying or whatever they're doing where they're convinced that the world isn't real. Mm, yeah. But they're just about to find out how real the world is. Yeah. So for me, that is the perfect kind of metaphor for everything ungrounded spirituality right there in that image. And obviously, if our goal is to preserve the species and to take care of this beautiful Mother Earth, we're not going to do it in dissociative states. Sure, we need to pull up and out of our localized self to have a vaster perspective at certain stages of our own journey then come back down into our humanness as an integrated being, as a truly empowered sacred activist who's really, truly artfully present, for sure. But if we keep going so far away, witnessing, 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 watching, 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 well, if you're witnessing that much, you're not doing anything. It's like praying versus getting your boots on the ground and doing something. Now is the time for us to get our boots on the ground and do something about what we're doing to ourselves and to our planet. And boots on the ground means going deep inside of the emotional caverns of your beingness and doing the work to clear your individual and ancestral debris so that you can then come through that process as a more empowered, present, integrated alchemist of all that is. And from that place of strength and solidity and true clarified focus, you can actually make a real difference in our world. Wow. Yeah. Alchemy is the integration of all of our emotions and making sure that we can keep everything grounded. Well, just be here. Just be here. I mean, what does be here now mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's a very tricky term, power of now, be here now. I mean, it sounds very captivating. But if that doesn't include the power of then, that is going back down the path and reclaiming all that material that's still holding you back and living within you and self-berating you, then you're not in the present. You think you're in the present, your mind might be in the present, but in a holistic sense, you're not in the present at all. Absolutely. So thank you so much for your work in the world, Jeff. It's really been a heart and mind opener for me personally on my journey. And I'm sure really thrilled to introduce you for the second time to my listeners. What is next for you? Are you working on anything new? Yeah, I'm doing some audio courses now. I have an Awakening Men's course that's just about to be launched that I've been working on off and on for years. That should come out this autumn on jeffbrown.co and Soul Shaping Institute. I'm working on a Grounded Spirituality course and also a Grounded, grounded Spirituality Teachable Model. I'm moving in the direction of doing certain gender interface and race-related interface models and frameworks that I'm going to want to try to bring into the world starting in the spring of 2020. And yeah, just running all the different things that I've been doing for a long time, publishing and all the rest of that. Thank you so much for joining me on The Art of Humanity. Thank you, Jess. Appreciate it. You made it to the end of this podcast. This means the world to me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation feel free to hop on over to my podcast website, artofhumanity.io, for show notes or past interviews. You can also message me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. My name is Jessica Ann, and my handle is beingishuman. That's B-E-I-N-G-I-S-H-U-M-A-N. I'd love to hear from you and learn more about what you've enjoyed from this episode. If you really love this podcast, I'd highly appreciate it if you went on Apple Podcasts right now and left a review. It helps way more than you know. You can also share this episode with two of your friends who you think would enjoy it. Let's get the Art of Humanity movement going. Thank you for listening. Until the next episode, evolve your business with the Art of Humanity. Listen, explore, evolve.